You maybe want to kill this one? Oh. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, buenos dias. Thank you for being here. Um, we want to start this morning. This is, of course, is a very um, difficult topic to, to talk about, but we have to do it anyway. And so as a way to introduce uh, our message for today, we want to watch a very short video. When we strip it all away, the politics, the social justice, the right to this, the right to that, the judgment, the shame, what are we left with? A human being. start by, by just letting you know that I know many people, probably there are people in this audience this morning that, oh, I'm sorry, that wasn't me, sorry. <laughs> you always have to blame someone. Uh, I know there's, there are people in this room that may have probably experienced uh, abortion, maybe a family member of yours experienced abortion, maybe you encourage someone to have an abortion, uh, maybe you pay for one. Uh, whatever the case is, um, <clears throat> I just want to start by just telling you that uh, we're not here to judge. We're not here to, to make you feel bad, guilty. Uh, I just as you saw in the video, uh, the, the main purpose of this message is to see what God has to say about this. But also, in the, way, the same way we start, we want to finish with hope. We want to finish with the idea and start with the idea that there is not, um, this sin is not unforgivable, that God always offers forgiveness. Always. There is no one sin that I can tell you that He cannot forgive. And so if you haven't done it yet, even before I start, I want you to receive that forgiveness. And. Because um, that's why Jesus died on the cross. He died for your mistakes and uh, for my mistakes. Amen. Amen. You know, the, the, I want to start with the good news. And the good news is just the last uh, data that we receive, uh, official data from CDC, we have seen a decrease in abortions in the past uh, few years, um, you, know, we st you know, you go down to 1996, we got 1.36 million children being killed. 
And I'm gonna be, I'm gonna start out front telling you that I'm gonna call abortion killing or murder, that's what it is. So I'm gonna start with that, uh, just to be plain and clear. Um, so, you know, by 2015, we went down to 885,000 abortions, roughly. And so there is a decrease, newer, uh, younger generations or new generations, they have more access to information. Uh, and that, that, that probably is, is helping a lot in, 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 in young ladies and uh, young men uh, making better decisions. And you may ask, but who are the ones who are doing this? Are mostly uh, ladies or women in their 20s. The biggest number of abortion Abortion comes from this group. And so, but then again, just uh, as a, as a positive, positive note, we need to see that numbers are, are going down. And it has to do with people being involved, it has to do with education, it has to do with media, it has to do with science. There's so many things that are happening right now out there. But we need to, I have to be clear, clear also that from 1973, and we, you know, we're, aware of that date, and we will talk about that a little bit later, but from 1973 to 2018, we're talking about 45 years, we have killed in this country near or very close to 60 million children. 60 million children have been killed in this nation, in this Christian nation. So when you look at what Hitler did, this is just three times four times higher. And this is happening right in front of our eyes. And so I want to see, you know, we want you to see a few things because, you know, just to see reality. I just want you to see reality. There is a lot of people talking trash in media. We'll see, I guess if we have time, some of that, saying things that are not true. Uh, there is a, a, a very famous word today, or a phrase, fake news. There's a lot of fake news going on. But if you see only 0.5% of the abortions come out of, of rape. Because always people, well, hey, what happened if somebody went through a horrible rape? Uh, rape? Well, there is, the number is very small. And when you look at all the things that you might say, well, there is a, is a medical problem, it is a physical problem, it is, it is very, very, very small. The percentages of, of uh, abortions that are happening in this country. And then when you compare, for example, 2004 and, and, and 1987, you know, you see about in 1997, 13% of the, the, the women, just, they didn't want to be a single mom. They didn't feel that they have what it takes to raise a kid. 8% in 2004, not much of a difference, some difference. Uh, in 2004, people say, well, I'm done having children. I don't want any more children. I got enough in my plate. And that was the end of that life. 23% in 2004, 24%, but I cannot afford a baby. It is just I don't have the money, I don't have the resources. And younger people say they're not ready for a child. They're ready to have fun. They're ready to do things that you should do when you're married, but they're not ready for a child. And, you know, 6%, and so when you add that up, there is something that is, is, is the reality of what happened in this country, is the majority of the abortions are not taking place because a woman's life is in danger, or because there was a, a, a horrific rape, which is, that's what they're selling in media. It's not true. You know where, where abortions are taking place, according to these numbers, is because of the sake of convenience. It's not convenient for me. It's not convenient for me to bring this child to the world. I had a personal experience um, with somebody that I, that I know, uh, and, uh, and she went through this horrible situation where she was rape by a close family member. And that happened several times. And she, she got pregnant. And, and, you know, if somebody decides, well, you know, I can't do this, you may understand, right? You may say, well, 
Maybe that the baby is going to be a reminder, I guess, every day of what happened. It's a family member. What people are going to say. What family neighbors are going to say. And her own guilt, her own sense of uh, betrayal and hurt. And she struggled with this. What to do? But her... Her inner spirit, you can call it the voice of God that everybody has inside, told her, don't do it. And guess what? She didn't do it. She went through with her pregnancy. She had a baby. And she told me that this, he has been the, the biggest blessing in my life. And so when people say, again, if, if you, let's say we're talking about you know, rape, my question is, it's not the baby's fault. It's not the baby's fault. And, and, and I, I told this, this lady that, you know, she, I told her, you, you, I mean, you, you are one of my heroes. Because she's showing this baby unconditional love. She's showing this baby what Jesus did for us. And so we can, again, we can make excuses and we can say, you know, whatever we want. But there are no excuses. There are no excuses. And, and there are many options that we have today, and Hope Clinic is, is one of those options. They are there to help you go, uh, go through uh, to, uh, difficult times like that. And so those lives that we're talking, those uh, almost 60 million children were terminated, most of them, for the sake of convenience. Because it's not practical, because I need to continue my education, because my boyfriend is not going to support me because I don't know what my, my parents are going to say. And you, you, know, you can find all the, all the you can uh, rationalize all of what you want. We are all familiar with Roe v. Wade, and, and this, it was the, this was the ruling by the, by the U.S. Supreme Court on January 22, 1973. I mean, it's going to be 45 years in, in the next few weeks. And, and they, they decided that criminal, criminalizing abortion in most instances violated a woman's constitutional right of privacy. So that's her private life, and we, the, the government should not interfere. And what she was looking for, you know, is, uh, of course, you know, Jane Roe was a fictional name. It was used at the time to protect her identity. And you don't know her real name is Norma McCorvey. If you want to send her an email, I'm just kidding. And we want to talk about her later. But Norma McCurvey, and she was fighting for an absolute right to terminate pregnancy. That government could not dictate because it's your body, it's your private life, and it's not your business. And so I guess, the, you know, it was, you know, I was not out here at the time. It was an existing pro, and I was not in existence, but um, they, the, the court uh, decided that abortion is legal at approximately the end of the first trimester. And that's kind of the time when if a baby gets out, he can survive. So that was kind of the, the compromise that they, they came up with. And uh, they, they, no, they located the point at capability of meaningful life outside of the mother's womb, or what other people call viability. And so that was kind of what, uh, the, what they decided. And it, was, um, it was the point. And of course, that brought 60 million kids dead, killed in horrific ways. Because believe it or not, they feel pain. And we want to see some of, the, uh, some of these things. So what I wanted to, for you guys to realize is it's just because something is legal in this country, in the eyes of men, it doesn't make it right in the eyes of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Right. If they want to legalize marriage between two women or two men or three or four or five or whatever they want to do it, okay, that's fine. The government can say whatever they want to say, but that doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it uh, 
uh, right in the eyes in the eyes of the Lord. And we see many uh, instances where the apostles, uh, Acts chapter four, for example, that they say, "You have to judge if we want to obey what you say, or we want to obey what God's, God has to say." And so we need to come to a point when we need to understand that uh, uh, the government doesn't dictate life. It doesn't dictate marriage. And the government is not above the Bible or God. Amen. And we need to make sure that we understand that. So we need to remember also when these people made this decision in 1973, there was not a 3D sonogram. And parents didn't have the ability to see a baby smiling at them. And that's the things that I, I, I pray because, you know, if you hear the, the pro-life people, they're trying to, uh, they are looking for ways so the mom can see the baby. It's not a blob. It's not a piece of mass. It's not a fetus. Is that the word? It's, a, it's, not a, it's a human being that is inside you. And so this idea of, of having the, the mom, just imagine you having those doubts and and again, the media is telling you, oh, it's not really a human being. It's, it's something that cells put together. They're not really. And I don't know how can this decide what it is. And they're trying to confuse people. But what happens when you go in and you see this? And you see this baby smiling at you. And I think that should probably make a difference. And you can see some of the babies already are showing their personality. And I imagine, you know, I imagine uh, Wayne Holt being someone like this <laughs> in the womb, you know. And so this is this is just this is just beautiful. Now we're talking about you know the th the first trimester, but by eight weeks, because that's kind of the point where these people say, well, we want to call a human life after the three the first trimester. First three months, because, you know, they can live by themselves. They can survive outside of the womb. But by eight weeks, brothers and sisters, eight weeks, a baby can, will suck their thumb. You will see them doing this. They, they respond to sound. And now there is, again, with science, there is evidence that they dream. They can dream. And, and one something, uh, something that is, is very, uh, it, will tell, it will tell us a lot, about eight weeks, we're talking about eight weeks, they will recoil from pain. You know, sometimes they're doing surgery in, inside the womb. And I don't know if you remember, do you guys remember this picture? I remember this picture. And, and that was taken here at Vanderbilt in 1998. It was one of the first surgeries inside the womb. And this, you see, this is a little guy holding the finger of the, of the doctor. And so, when the doctor goes in, you know, to work on the, the baby, about eight weeks, you know, the baby goes like this. He goes away. He tries to move away. His brain is telling him, there's something wrong with that needle. It's going to hurt. And they, they kind of go, they, they pick up their, their leg, it goes like this, trying to run away from the needle. And you know, in one of those uh, um, abortion Practices they take the, pan, the, the uh, spinal cord out to kill the baby, or they drill a hole in the brain to kill the baby. That's that's human sacrifice. You might say something else, but for me, that's baby sacrifice, and that's something that you see in the Bible happening from the beginning. The people that came out of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, started that with a, a guy called Molech. And they have this big sculpture uh, out of iron. And the sculpture had their hands like this. And they put fire. So the whole thing, because it was iron, it, I mean, it was burning. And they put the baby on top. Newborn baby on top. To give it to the gods or idols. And then there was fire. And so the ma mothers and the family will not... So to, to avoid family hearing the baby crying, they had drums and music so they couldn't hear the baby screaming. Of pain, and and that's human sacrifice, and that was was uh, uh, was going on uh, back in the day. By eight weeks, the heart is pumping, kidneys are clearing fluids, the nervous system has developed, and again, it will tell you when the baby is moving away, you can tell that the, the brain is working, right? 
there is some, some uh, a, a slice there. And you know what the beautiful thing is? By eight weeks, they have a, their own fingerprint, their own DNA, their own personality. They're smiling at you. They're like, you see a picture of a baby like this, and you know what's coming, right? And you see a happy baby already. And nearly all one million abortions committed last year were performed after eight weeks, not before, after eight weeks. So those babies felt the pain. They experienced uh, murder in, in the womb. Some, we were reading this, this morning, we, sometimes we believe that, you know, God, you know, he just put some uh, laws in place and now he's hidden somewhere in the universe and he forgot about us. But that's not what the Bible says. And we read this morning Psalm 139 verses 13 and 14. But this is just a, a piece of that. And the Bible says here, uh, David, inspired by the Spirit, for you created my inmost, inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you and I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful and I know that full well. And the question is, do we know that full well? Do we know that life comes from God? That he is the giver of life? That he is involved in your life even before you were born? Do you believe that? Just raise your hand if you believe that God was involved with you. That he knew you before you even were born. You know, there is, uh, you know, during Christmas time, I, you know, I knew this would happen and I was thinking about, uh, you know, what to say. And, you know, you read about Jesus, but then, you know, you read about his cousin. Uh, cousin. And in Luke chapter 1, talking about John the Baptist, this is what the angel said. To the parents, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine. Are you listening to that? No wine. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. And listen to this. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Even before. He is born. So babies, as fetus, as they call them, or whatever names they, they give them, so they, they're trying to dishumanize a baby. They even, as we see in the testimony of the scriptures, they could be filled with the Holy Spirit already. That doesn't happen to an animal. The Holy Spirit doesn't get inside an animal, or a thing, or a blob, or a cell. I mean, this is a human being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. God had a plan for him. I want you to reflect on, on something. Uh, are you, you know, we are go, you know, we're going through this right now with my mother-in-law. She's going through, you know, she went through cancer treatment and we're praying for her. And don't you, this, you don't have the desire of somebody coming out with a cure for cancer? Would you like to have a cure for cancer? Where people can go and do it and, and be. And what happens if between those 60 million, God has someone, this is going to be so, this kid's going to be so smart, and these people have been praying for a cure for cancer, and we're killing them. We're not letting them come and fulfill their, 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 their um, purpose in this life. 60 million. I want you to stay with that number in your head. 60 million kids have been murdered in this country in our own eyes, in front of us. Just right in front of us. And that's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. I know we're talking and we're reading here that um, when the, the baby's in the womb, he understands. I remember when Gigi was little, I was not sure it was her elbow or her knee. But she used to, you know, when she was in the womb, move, she, you know, she still moves a lot. <laughs> She's a lot of moving all over the place. And, and so I remember Sarah being pregnant with me and, you know, being on, you know, on the bed. And I seen something kind of popping out of the womb. 
And I know it was the elbow, and I used to touch it like this, and she was like, and I was, I, I love to do that. And, it, and so this is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a person there. Look, one forty-one. When Elizabeth heard Mary's reading, you know, Mary came to see her. She, you know, Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, she heard that, you know, the angel came and told her, you want to have a baby, and you want to call him Emmanuel, Jesus. And so she went and be, to visit her, because uh, she got the news that her Elizabeth was also pregnant, even though she was very old. She didn't do, you know, she had, he, she had not the, the capability of having children because of her age. So when Elizabeth heard, heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And, Eli and, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. How about that? And then look at the connection then. Uh, verse 43, same chapter. But why am I so favored, she says, Elizabeth, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Listen, listen to the connection. As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in the womb leaped for joy. So she's making the connection that the baby heard and felt Jesus, the mother of Jesus. And, and again, we're seeing that by eight weeks, the brain is already functioning. And we see that kids, the babies in the womb, react to light, react to, to, to um, um, movement and, and, and all these things. And so the Bible is already, you know, over 2,000 years ago, giving us uh, a, a testimony that we're talking about, we're talking about babies. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. The, the, word of the, Lord, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So we're talking about, well, he's not a baby until whatever. Before even he came to the womb, God knew Jeremiah. I knew you before you were born. I set you apart. I, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And so uh, I can go on and on and on to tell you that the Bible never called babies fetuses or blobs or anything like that. They are babies. They're always babies. And, and again, we are in this culture because we, even Christians, we live by what the culture dictates. And this culture is offering their kids to the idol of convenience. To the idol of what people are going to say about me. And we are sacrificing these children. In Jeremiah 32, 35, they built the high place of Baal that are in the valley of Ben-Hinnon. That's where the word hell comes from. To cause their sons and their daughters. They call them sons and daughters. To pass through the fire to Molech. Molech. Molech is the name of the God. Molech which I had not commanded them, nor had I, it entered my mind that they should do this abomination. So sacrificing and killing your own children is an abomination. It doesn't matter if they're in or out. It's an abomination in the sight, um, in the sight of the Lord. So I want you to understand and get out of this place understanding then abortion, abortion is murder. And you know what's happening, which is very, I'm going to start kind of closing pretty soon, is that even the people that are pro-choice, this guy, this Dr. Warren, whatever last name is, her, he, is, he works by, uh, for the biggest abortion clinic in the world. And he wrote a book, a medical book, that's kind of the... The, the teaching book, the textbook about abortion practice. And he says, listen to this horrible testimony of this guy. The sensations of dismemberment, because that's what they do to the kid, flow through the forceps like an electric current. They feel the baby dying. And they don't care. 
And this lady, I want you to research. I don't have time to tell you much about her. I just want to let you know that, very, very, that she's very outspoken. She writes for the New York Times. She has been in all the major networks in this country. She writes for different articles, for different magazines on this topic. Her name is Mary Elizabeth Williams. And she says, they don't deny it anymore. There is no way to deny that we're talking about human life. I believe that's what a fetus is. Where am I here? It's a human life and doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. In other words, she doesn't care we're killing babies. Yet, a fetus can be human life without the rights as the woman in whose body it resides. So she says these babies have no rights. The wom women are the boss. We are owners of our bodies and we can do with our bodies or whatever is inside their bodies, whatever they, whatever they want. And so who is giving these people this authority to kill children? I will put the life of a mother over the life of a fetus every single time, even if I still need to acknowledge my conviction that the fetus is indeed a life. Listen to this. A life worth sacrificing. Brothers and sisters, we're sacrificing children in this nation. That's just what's happening. And I want you to understand this. Amos, one of the prophets of the Old Testament, give us a, a, another view from God, how God sees this. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the sons of Ammon, and for four I will not revoke its punishment. Because they ripped open the pregnant woman of Gilead in order to enlarge their borders. And God said, punishment is going to come, and punishment came. So I want to end, you know, start closing this message with hope. We hope because, again, as we saw at the beginning, we see that, the, you know, at least by 2015, we see that uh, abortions are less and less and less. But the main point I want you to understand is we need to educate our children. We need to talk about this. You know what's the problem with us Christians? And I'm including me. It's just all of us. We don't talk about this until election time. Okay, who is going to be, who is pro-choice? Well, I'm going to vote, vote for that guy. Somebody ha had no business being a president. But I'm going to have to vote for that. For me, I mean, that's, that's a voting issue for me. I'm not going to vote for a guy who is killing children. I'm sorry. And then we got, that's the only time when we think about uh, 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 gay marriage. That's the only time when we think about uh, abortion. And then what happened the next four years? Nothing is happening. Tell me, what something is happening right now in this country for abortion to help change those laws? Nothing is happening. And so uh, if we really, if you guys, if we, because I'm part of this nation, if we really love this nation, we need to pray for this nation, number one. Because punishment can be coming pretty soon after 45 years of killing children. And that can happen. We believe that God is in our sight, right? No, God is with us. Not really. Because he doesn't support the killing of children. So number one, the number one thing that I want you to do today and every day until something changes, pray for this nation. Pray, pray for our president that they can start doing something. As you are you pro-life, pro do something about it. Do something about it. And we, as, as Christians, we need to do something about it. We need, you, know, you remember, the prophets, Isaiah, for example, when they started their ministry, they didn't only pray for their own sins. They prayed for the sins of what? The whole nation. And you guys need to pray for the sins of this nation. Moral sins. What happened in, 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 in our streets, in our schools, in our houses. But there is a, is a promise in John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. 
You know what? People that hate God, there is a lot of haters. People that hate God, they don't like to listen. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that even if, if you were willing, for whatever reason, to kill your own baby, he will forgive you if you confess your sin, if you repent of your sin. Because people want to put God as an as a evil, bad guy. No, he's not an evil bad guy. He wants to save you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to give you a second opportunity. And so if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from some unrighteousness. Is that what it says? Are you reading? It says, and purify us from all unrighteousness. All. And so there is not a one single sin that God cannot forgive. And again, I'm going to talk back to you. If you encourage your daughter to get an abortion, God can forgive you. If you pay for an abortion, God can forgive you. And I, I haven't studied and listened, and I, there is a preacher, I saw him preaching on the, on the subject. He himself, when he was in college, he got a girl pregnant, and she came and told him, listen, I'm pregnant. Are you with me or not? He said he was 21, drinking, having a good time. And I said, no, I cannot be a father. They bought a pill, went to his apartment, she took the pill, she started bleeding and bleeding and bleeding, went to the toilet, and the baby came, the baby came out. And then they flushed the baby away. He said, we cried. We didn't know why, but we cried and cried. And then after that, we went separate ways. And a lot of things happened in his life, and now he's a minister. And he said, I found, I, I found forgiveness in Christ. So I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what happened, what you did, or what you didn't do. There is forgiveness for you, but you need to confess your sins. One of the beautiful things about Hope Clinic, and we have Megan uh, outside, she is the community relation, relations manager, is that we can volunteer. I mean, I'm thankful, and, and one of the things that we always say in this church, how generous we are, and we're very thankful that you brought those bottles. But they, I, I talked to the CEO this week, we have a meeting, Renee is, is her name, and she said, we need more than money. We need people to get involved. And, and we are, I mean, again, this congregation is so generous. I just came back from Colombia uh, uh, doing some mission work, helping Venezuelans with, with medicine. And it's because individuals from this church gave me money to go and do that. I just came back. And, but you know, brothers and sisters, and the elders want this. This is going to happen in February. We want to have a ministry fair. And we want to show you all the ministries that we have inside the church and outside the church. And Megan is going to come back, and she's going to have their uh, sign-up sheet of paper. And so you can go there and, and volunteer. And, and my prayer, and, and the elders hope we have in this ministry fair, is that besides giving money, that this church is going to start giving time. Are you willing to give time to causes like this? We cannot just be here and being impressed. I see a lot of people looking at me like, oh boy, this is heavy. It is heavy. I know it's heavy. But we need to stop looking at each other like, oh, we need to start serving. We need to start uh, volunteering. This is the volunteer state. Hopefully, we will change the, the motto, any of the volunteer church. Because we're really generous. But we need to be generous with our time. So we got ministries in the high school, in the middle school, in the high school, and we are, I was talking to the people at the, uh, at the branch, they need people on Saturdays, because before, well, during the week, well, now they need people on Saturdays to feed the poor. Please take a Saturday, once a month, and if we have a lot of people, we want to have more, more help that we need. That's what we, we want, I want to tell people, hey, we, need, we have enough help, find something else to do. But sometimes I'm, I'm manning people from my own Hispanic group because I don't, sometimes I don't have enough volunteers. So we need volunteers for all these uh, uh, causes. And, and the Hope Clinic, I mean, this is a wonderful organization. They walk about 700 families a year through an unplanned pregnancy. They provide health care for about 600 women every year. And about, uh, they provide counseling services to about 
200 individuals every year. So they're doing an awesome job, but the lady told me we need volunteers. So that's the call. The call is number one, to pray for this nation, to pray for the president, to, to, to pray for people in power. But number two, do something about it. Do something about it. It's not just about praying and, 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 and paying other people. Do you, you need to do something about it. They need volunteers. You, at the end, I'm going to please encourage you to stop and talk to, to Megan about what, you can, what can you do for this. And when we have next month, February, in a few weeks, we're going to have this ministry fair. She's going to come back. And you can contact me during the week. And there are other services I was talking to Renee this week that they can provide for the church. They can come here to teach our kids to teach our ladies, single people, about what's happening in, in, out there with this issue. Amen? So I'm going to leave today with, well, this, before this, you know who she is? She's Jane Rowe. And she changed. Norma. And now she is against abortion. That happened in 1998, 20 years later. And now she's dedicating her life. I'm dedicated to spending the rest of my life undoing the law that be bears my name. That's a big load to carry, right? But she found Jesus. She found redemption. And she's now in our side. Okay, so there is hope. And I'm gonna finish up with a message. I've been uh, affiliated with Hope Clinic since 1985. It all started as a result of a Sanctity of Life Sunday at our church where a lady got up and said, well, y'all oppose abortion, but what about the women that have already had one? What are we going to do with them? I had had the abortion in 1964, so it had been over 20 years since um, I began to deal with it. So you can imagine how buried uh, all of my emotions had been all that time. It was a long, slow process. I cried and cried and cried and cried, 21 years worth of tears, and finally made it through. I was asked to lead a group, so I did, a post-abortion uh, healing group. It was hard, but it was healing and helpful. I don't know where I'd be today if I hadn't gone through it. Still in denial, I guess. Men are coming out now and saying I need healing from the memories of making such a bad decision. So I, I just think uh, post-abortion counseling is one of the major uh, outreaches for Hope Clinic. I know for myself, I wouldn't have been able to do the things that I have done to serve the Lord had I not had the opportunity to go through the training and the, and the healing here. I think when you walk in the door, you feel the presence of the love of the Lord here. You don't feel any uh, condemnation, judgment. You just find people who are, love you and want to help you get on a good path. Coming to Hope Clinic really changed my whole perspective on life. I was so full of guilt and shame and unworthiness and didn't have a clue that I could be forgiven, much less forgive myself. I was just tired of living a secret life. You know, they say we're only as sick as our secrets, and I do believe that because there's freedom. And of course, the other thing, my reason for not giving birth was to protect my parents in my counseling all these years, you'd be surprised at the number of young women that had an abortion because they didn't want their parents to find out what they had done. I have no children. I have no grandchildren. But you know what? God has restored what the locusts have destroyed. It's just amazing how many pretend or adopted grandchildren we've got. So I'm, I'm a happy person. <laughs> I just feel so thankful that um, God had mercy on me and put me where he did at the, at the right time in the right place. <laughs> hope wins. Hope wins. Hope wins. Hope, 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 hope wins. So I'm going to ask you to want to stand up at this point. We want to ask uh, our elders to come forward. Not to repent. 
<laughs> but to be here, if you want to come, if you want to come and pray for this nation, you can come and pray with our elders. If you want to come and pray for a family member that went through this horrible situation, you can come and pray. If you want to come and pray for a hope clinic, if you want to pray for this congregation, that people can finally do something about this, because we're responsible for what's happening. This is a good time. As our brother leads us in some songs, uh, I'll be up here too uh, to help you with whatever need you have in your heart. May the Lord bless you.